know, I'm 32 now. I'm hoping to make one more run and try and make the Paris Olympics. It would be such an awesome experience. And for me, I haven't won an Olympic medal. So I'm really, really hoping that, you know, we can get together a group and as a group and, and pull out a really awesome performance and get back on the podium, which is a really, really tough challenge to do. There's so many countries around us, uh, around the world that play basketball at such a high level. Ever wonder what it's like to be an athlete on the world's biggest stage? And what really goes on inside the village? Let's find out. Legends with Bevo. The road to Tokyo. Thanks to Anytime Fitness Glenelg, Renalek Electrical Services. Mariana Tolo, great to have you on Legends with Bevo, The Road to Tokyo. Uh, now, obviously, it was a disappointing campaign in the way in terms of it ended for the Opals, but a lot of positives to take out of it. And you personally, you had a breakout game against Puerto Rico and what was an amazing game for the Opals to get into the quarters. You scored 26 points and had 17 boards. Uh, talk to us through that game and then we'll obviously talk about the US game after that. Yeah, look, our backs were kind of in a corner and the only way we could get through and get onto the quarterfinals was to fight out of that. And I think, you know, we worked to our strengths that game, which was our size advantage because Puerto Rico were quite small. So that's why I kind of had a big impact in the game because I came in with the mentality that I knew that I had to step up and um, really focus on going to work inside and, and yeah, playing a big physical game in there. And, you know, I can't take all the credit because it's a team sport and my teammates are really good at getting me the ball and then helping me out with some really good passes as well. 17 boards is like probably the most rebounds I've ever had in my life. So <laughs> I think it just kind of spoke to the, the desperation of the moment because we knew that we had to win by 25 points or more to get through the quarters, which is crazy. And I've never experienced something like that before. And I think, you know, in that first half, every, half everyone kind of knew we had to win by so much and wanted to, but yeah, couldn't quite find the way to do it. And we just ground it down and over time. We were able to find our stride and, and smash out that game, which was definitely a highlight of the tournament. I like the whole of Australia was was watching the game with uh, bated breath, and obviously, like you mentioned, at half time it was a bit scary. I'm like, come on, girls, you, you need to uh, you need to win by 27 plus, and then you did such a great job of doing that. And even though it came down to the dying seconds, but was there a feeling at half time where you a little bit sort of thinking, oh, is this going to happen, or did, were you pretty confident that you could still go ahead and, and have a big second half? Oh, there's always that doubt in your mind, like, oh no, are we going to be able to pull this out? And we went into that game with the approach that we only had to win each quarter by about seven points. And if we did that, then the result would take care of itself. So at halftime, we, we weren't 14 points up like we'd planned. We knew we had to pick it up even more and just kind of had that goal of being up by 10 or so in the third quarter. And we started to do that, um, which was great. Uh, and we did it through like our defensive intensity and forcing them to make some turnovers, which we could punish on and, and some really nice hands and steals from players and, and really running the floor as well. That helped us to increase the lead. Do you feel as though going into the game against the US, like you've sort of used up all your petrol tickets because you put so much energy into that Puerto Rico game as well? Or is it just the fact the US is such an amazing side? I think credit to the US, they are an amazing team. They're so powerful and they've been so dominant over the last 30 years in women's basketball. They've won every Olympics. So they're really, really strong. And whenever you have, and you can see that when the Boomers play the US, when our Gems under 19s team play, whenever you give them a sniff and you, you know, make a couple of mistakes, they really punish you and they punish you with scoring. Um, shooting the lights out and then it happens really quickly where that spread gets out to like 15 points and it's really, really hard to get back from. So yeah, it's always tough to play against the US. They are gettable. We showed that in our practice game that we beat them, but we need to do it um, when it counts in the tournament play. I guess a bit like the men's as well. They were up by 15 in the second quarter and then they got run over in the in the game against the US. So, but like you said, it's it's certainly both in the men's and women's a lot of exciting things to take forward uh, going into Paris. For sure, and um, you know, I'm 32 now. I'm hoping to make one more run and try and make the Paris Olympics. It would be such an awesome experience, and for me, I haven't won an Olympic medal, so I'm really, really hoping that you know we can get together a group and as a group and 
and pull out a really awesome performance and get back on the podium, which is a really, really tough challenge to do. There's so many countries around us, uh, around the world that play basketball at such a high level. And, you know, there was a couple of teams in this Olympics for women's basketball, and it was their first ever Olympics. Um, so to get there in the first place is hard, and then to perform at your best is even harder. So I'm really f- looking forward to another chance to do that. And I think if you watch the under nine teams, you see our upcoming talent is really exciting and and gives you a little bit of hope that we're going to be really good in the future. So I hope and I think our team will be even better in Paris. And yourself personally, uh, we just spoke about this off air. This is super exciting for you. You have to play overseas in France. Uh, tell us all about this and congratulations. I have signed a contract to play with Basket Lance in France, which is in the southwest of France. I'll leave September 5th. So I'm in quarantine now. When I get out on Sunday, I'll have two weeks before I go. And so I'll be heading overseas and playing there for nine months. We'll play in the French League as well as Euro League. So we'll play a number of games against different teams all over Europe and, and try to win that and be the best European team. So it's a really good competition and it's been six years since I played there last. So I'm really excited to be back in France playing for a team there. Oh, how wonderful. Congrats again. And, mm-hmm. and let's uh, talk about Tokyo. I went to Rio where we again got to the quarterfinal and, and we ended up losing to Serbia by two points and not making the final. So that was heartbreaking as well. Yeah. Um, too much heartbreak. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, well, how did you find the the difference between, I mean, obviously you've spoken to other Olympians that have been there this year at Tokyo and they've talked about the COVID protocols and what have you, which we all know about, but how did you actually find the difference inside the Olympic Village between, you know, Tokyo versus Rio 2016? I think it could actually be turned into a bit of a uh, benefit in some ways because in Rio, we could go watch any other sport, do other things. Whereas in Tokyo, it was literally we stayed in the village and went to your sport and that's it. So there was this real sense of everyone getting behind each other and really supporting each other. We had areas set up where there were, you know, fold out chairs in front of TVs and the cafe area where everyone would get co- coffees every day. And everyone was really in tune with what was going on and who was competing for the day and and cheering each other on. My favorite moment was towards the start of the Olympics when Brendan Smith was in his individual medley race. And it was really, really exciting because he came from behind and there was a group of us there and we're all screaming at the TVs and he ended up winning the bronze medal. And it was such a special moment. And it really, really, I guess, inspired me for the rest of that Olympics. And where were you when the Boomers obviously uh, won bronze? Because the whole of Australia was celebrating and, and no doubt you Opals, Opals girls were too. Uh, where were you when this all happened? Well, I was actually in a plane coming home. So, oh, um, we no. Just, yeah. <laughs> Worst so timing. We, yeah, we'd just taken off and we were in the air and I looked at the time and I was like, oh, I think I can buy Wi-Fi here. So I bought an hour of Wi-Fi, started just before half time and the hour cut out with two minutes to go in the game. But then... <gasps> They were up by 16 at that point anyway. So I figured, oh, oh they've got it in the bag. I don't need to buy another hour. And <laughs> sure enough, when we landed in Australia, I was very happy to hear the news that they had actually won. <laughs> oh, that's so lucky. Imagine if it was a close game and you couldn't watch the end of it. <laughs> I would have bought another hour if it was a close game. <laughs> Oh, classic. And uh, I, th- I heard some interesting stories about, oh, I, saw, I saw on social media, all the Aussie Boomers boys are uh, celebrating and there was other athletes involved in that as well. Was there a little bit of a bit of envy that you weren't able to be a part of that celebration? Yeah, for sure. I think it was so fun watching them celebrate and what was such a hard earned victory. You know, it's so pleasing to see that the way that they played and stuck together and what they did and the the way they did it, it was just beautiful. And they really, really deserve to celebrate. We wish we could have celebrated with them. But at the same time, I think everyone wanted to get home and, and start the quarantine process so they could go and see their families as soon as possible. So, yeah, it was a bit of catch-22. And how did you go without playing basketball without the crowds as well? Because obviously that's... Um... With the swimming, there was the teams allowed and, and you sort of had a bit more of an atmosphere. The basketball didn't seem to be that that way. Yeah, look, I think part of that was because our stadium was an hour away from the village. So it took a long time and it was quite hard to get access to go there. So not many other basketballers ever went to watch the basketball. 
we went to one men's game to cheer them on, but that was it. It was interesting with that crowd. It kind of didn't have that atmosphere, but at the same time, it just put more onus on us to really be loud on the bench and celebrate and, and cheer and towel wave and create our own little atmosphere that we were playing for us and not for anyone else. You know who I did feel bad for, though, was the Japanese women's team who ended up in the gold medal game. Like That stadium was huge. Mm. And that would have been packed. Yeah. Absolutely packed to the rafters if they could have had people there. And so I was really sad and disappointed for them because they deserved it so much. They played so well and have been doing so well over the last few years. So I wish they could have experienced that. Yeah, that's so sad, isn't it? And but a credit to the the Japanese for, you know, making the Olympics happen. There was so much negativity about going into it and a lot of people were saying, you know. Um, whether or not it should go ahead. The locals, I think 80% of them didn't want it to happen and a phenomenal achievement that it went went ahead and not only went ahead, it was unbelievable, like world like world record ratings around the world. Obviously, a lot of people in lockdown made a difference to that, but it was just such a fantastic Olympics and I think everyone embraced it and especially with it being postponed, I think people enjoyed it even more. Did you get that feeling as well? Definitely and I think it's what the world needed right now. You know, country pride, and something to cheer for and and so many people got behind us and we felt so much the love the the way that that olympic international olympic committee organized everything made us feel so safe over there and i think that was really a positive thing because a lot of us you know were a little bit worried as to how it would be and what the situation would be but it felt completely safe the whole time we were getting tested every day it's actually funny the tests were quite strange in that um Every day we'd have to get this little vial, it was a little tube, and you'd spit into the tube (laughs) until it reached a certain amount. (laughs) So you'd be sitting there in the morning just getting your test done and sending it off. It was a really strange COVID test, but yeah, it made everyone feel safe. And and what a great experience. And I think the whole of Australian team did so well, and it was so positive, and, and I'm so happy to have been a part of that. Yeah, well said. And I've spoken before to a couple other Olympians and love hearing about, I know Annabelle Smith back in the day, that was her fourth Olympics this year. And then back in the day, um, she spoke about sort of meeting Usain Bolt and David Beckham and some of her idols and getting selfies with them. Obviously, this time around, it was a little bit difficult because of the COVID situation. But in Rio, did you sort of get to have any selfies with some of your idols or have any any village crushes at all you want to share? (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I guess the people that I would recognize the most would be the NBA players. And I know a lot of our girls got selfies with them, um, including Doncic and Scola and Rudy Gobert, Mm -hmm. uh, the Gasols. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of famous basketballers there, which was pretty cool. But at the same time, you realize they're normal people and they probably hate getting photos every day. Like Doncic was literally being stopped every two seconds whenever I saw him (laughs) get a photo. So I felt so bad for him. But it was cool to see them interacting like any other person as well. And in terms of the postponement, obviously being one of the more experienced athletes, how did you deal with it personally, Mariana? Was it was it tough? Or did you sort of, was it one of those things where you expected it to happen knowing how bad COVID was? Yeah, I was kind of, I guess, happy that it was postponed and not cancelled at that point, that we still had a chance to go. It was actually quite tough being in that limbo of not knowing whether we were actually going to go ahead or it was going to be cancelled at one moment. I remember hearing a news article come out in the media saying so-and-so at a meeting said that they just came out of the meeting and it's going to be cancelled. There's no way it's going ahead. And I was supposed to do a swimming session that morning um, for conditioning. And I was like, well, I'm not swimming today then. And (laughs) why am I doing that? And then afterwards it came out that it wasn't really cancelled. And I was like, okay, I'll swim tomorrow. (laughs) (laughs) But it, it was hard. It was a big whirlwind and you had to kind of adapt your training as well. I know when lockdown happened last year, I was trying to get on all the outdoor basketball courts like every other Canberran and would have to fight people to get on the court and <laughs> and did different things like running outside on a field and a bit of yoga, things that I don't normally do, but it was a good chance to do something different and build my body in a, a different way, which was cool. And I, I was fortunate being based in Canberra that I didn't have to face too many lockdowns. It was that, just that big first initial one. So my training 
load was pretty good. Um, other than a change in the WBL season, which is a bit shorter, less games during the season, which I think did have an impact as well. But um, it was the best that we could make of the situation. And you're an ambassador for Kids Alive Water Safety Program. Tell us what, all about the program and, and your involvement and I guess what made you want to be a part of it, Mariana? I just think water safety is an important thing for every um, person to be able to have it all over Australia. We're surrounded by water and even in our households every day, it doesn't take much to, to drown in some water. And so if we can prevent any deaths from knowing the basics of water safety, that's a job well done. And I think Laurie Lawrence has done a great job of, of helping promote that with Stay Alive, Kids Do the Five, and we've just got to keep going and battling and, and trying to prevent as many accidental losses of life as possible. Yeah, well said. I, I definitely enjoyed chatting to Laurie recently, and as well as uh, Tammy and, and Mark Minicello, all three of us spoke at the same time. And it was it was it was hectic, but it was a lot of fun speaking to those guys. So now all of you, all of you are doing a, such a, a wonderful job, and it's such a, an important program, like you said, to be a part of. Yeah, it is, and that's you know a part of being a professional athlete or or an influencer is that you have a platform, and it's really important to be able to use that for good. And uh, for me, anytime I can jump behind any any good cause like this, I'll do it uh, hands down. So really excited to be a part of it and hoping I can spread the word. And I love hearing some, uh, some funny stories about teammates and, and what have you. Who are some of the, the funniest basketball teammates that you played with or you know, involved with the Opals or what have you? Kayla George is definitely the class clown of the group. <laughs> She's always um, you know, bubbly and energetic and making jokes and, and just being her general funny self. It's great. Um, also, Tessa Levy loves to throw a prank in there every now and then. So, oh, uh, please, she, please, please share. I love hearing the prank stories. <laughs> uh, oh, she'll be one to surprise you in the hallway, come around a corner and just scare the hell out of you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Gold. She loved the dad joke. So, I love hearing those as well. Have, have you got her back or? Oh, not really. No, you're too scared to? <laughs> I'm not a sneaky. I stand out a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. And uh, what's what's the most embarrassing moment throughout your basketball career? Gosh, I don't know. I think one Opals game that we had in Cairns once, I can't remember. I think we might have been playing against China. And I did something down the offensive look and then went to turn and run around back on defense and just totally tripped and fell flat on my face. <gasps> and oh, just, it was, <laughs> oh, no. in hindsight, it was funny, but it was quite embarrassing at the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's nasty. Hopefully you didn't injure yourself too bad. Nah, no, I was fine. <laughs> <laughs> and, and finally, the question that always stumps people, three famous people alive or dead who you'd love to have dinner with and why, Mariana? I would love to have dinner with Jamie Oliver if he was cooking. <laughs> because, hey, I love him as a chef. He's great and have a lot of his cookbooks. I would love to have dinner with Kathy Freeman. She's a fellow Mackay girl and probably the most iconic Australian athlete ever. So it would be cool just to talk to her and get her insights and, and how, how everything in Sydney went down. It would just be awesome to talk to her about that. And then the third one, gosh, who would it be? Luca Donkick. <laughs> nah, nah. nah. <laughs> um, See, I love it. It's stumps you guys, doesn't it? <laughs> I, always, I always think of people when, you know, when you're not doing things, you're like, oh, it'd be cool to meet them. And then when you get asked the question, you always forget. <laughs> but um, I actually have a, a weird hobby, which is fossil king, looking for gemstones. Wow. And there's, there's this couple that do it on YouTube called Liz and Wall, and it'd be cool to meet them. <laughs> that that <laughs> is so random, but I love it. <laughs> Very random. <laughs> that is great. Well, Mariana Tolo, thank you so much for joining us on Legends of Bevo, The Road to Tokyo. Uh, I wish you all the best over there in France. Thank you to Trina from Ignite PR for organizing the interview as well. Um, great job with everything you did with the Opals. And, and also everything you're doing with uh, being an ambassador for Kids Alive Water Safety Program, which is such an important cause. And uh, we look forward to speaking in the future. Awesome. Thanks for having me on and talk to you soon.
Bye, Bevo. Bye, thanks so much. 